So I want to take the next 15 minutes and uh, recap a few of the details that some of our previous speakers have hinted at, uh, but really focus in on what truly are the hazards that are presented to people who are doing the recycling themselves, the informal workers, but also to the communities that they live and work in. And so I wanted to begin this discussion by touching on something actually that Aubrey mentioned earlier. So we do have to acknowledge there's a tremendous amount of money tied up in e-waste recycling, both formally and in the informal economy. And so here's a, a table from a, a paper looking at Agbog Beloshi in, in Ghana. And I think it's important for us to recognize that not everybody is working on a level playing field at these sites. In Thailand, in Ghana, in Chile, there are various economic strata here. And so on the table, we've got basically towards the top people who are getting increasing uh, or larger economic benefit. And at the bottom, we've got people who are sort of at the bottom of the, the food chain economically. So there, there are more of them, but they're not benefiting so um, directly or uh, at such a degree. And so if we think about, uh, for example, the, the international firms that at the time were helping materials get in and out of uh, the Agbag Beloshi site, you know, there's $20,000 a month, uh, for example, uh, potential income there. Uh, a scrap dealer is going to make maybe $1,500 a month. We've got um, you know, sort of moving down the ladder again towards the people actually doing the recycling, uh, people doing collecting, and then unfortunately all the way down to child labor, which is a, a factor that we have to acknowledge at some of these sites at least. Uh, so the US dollar values I think are um, useful, but I think what's really useful is taking a look at what is the percentage of the Ghanaian minimum wage that these people are making at the various economic strata. And so you can see if you're a scrap dealer, you're sitting pretty high on the heap. You're making almost 3,000% uh, of the minimum wage there. Uh, some of the middle trades folks or uh, middle people are a little closer to 2,000%, but that's still a huge amount of income compared to the uh, Ghanaian daily minimum wage. Even the scrap collectors, as you see down here, are still making up to three times what folks make on the minimum wage. And unfortunately, when we get down to child labor, now we're talking people who are making a third of what the minimum wage is. But all this is to just reinforce the notion that people do this not maybe necessarily because it's uh, a green, sustainable thing to do, they do it for the money. And we've heard that in our uh, presentations from Thailand and Chile and Ghana as well. So I'm going to take a moment. I am an environmental health scientist. This is what I do. And I'm going to take a moment and poke a little bit of, uh, uh, I think, much needed uh, skepticism or critique towards the literature. So this is a pretty typical e-waste study. This is something that was published, I think, by no one in the room right now. And if this is yours, apologies in advance. Uh, but this, this is pretty standard. So here, here's 10 million chemicals that we measured in dirt, in blood, in duck eggs, somewhere in the community or in the worker. No real connection between if this stuff is present in the body, is it going to be harmful? No connection between if it's harmful, what are the health outcomes? And no connection to how is this actually getting into them and what can we do about it? So there are literally hundreds and hundreds of paper in, papers in the literature that look exactly like this. We don't need more papers like this. So I'm an academic. I have my credentials from publishing. I don't want to publish studies like this. These are not needed or particularly helpful at this point. What we know already is what I'm going to highlight here, some very evident hazards that you don't need more papers to document. What we need is action to do something about these. So if we think about occupational concerns uh, for these communities, it's been a historical fact that workers have always had the worst exposures to the worst uh, agents, biological, chemical, and physical hazards. And unfortunately for these e-waste communities, the workers are not only exposing themselves, they're actually creating exposures for the other members of their community. And so we've already talked about a number of hazards that are present. Uh, again, Thailand, Ghana, Chile, China, India, uh, basically any e-waste site around the uh, globe. So we're talking about people coming into direct contact with toxic heavy metals. We're talking potentially about people breathing in harmful air contaminants. We've seen lots of pictures of burning smoke plumes, um, both at a, at a grand scale, like at Agbagbloshi, uh, and also at a micro scale, like here in Chile. Uh, we've just heard both uh, Dr. Austin Brenneman and Dr. Joliet talk about injury risk, and actually these are substantial, so the risk of lacerations, the risk of being struck by flying e-waste, the risk of being hit by that e-waste delivery truck. Uh, we've got musculoskeletal or ergonomic issues. We've got the risk of burns from um, burning and heating these materials. We've heard a little bit already about noise and the risk of hearing loss. 
We have other issues too. So a lot of these sites are pretty poorly developed. Even the ones that are happening in people's homes uh, may not have adequate access to infrastructure like clean drinking water or sanitation. Uh, we've got people, uh, and we particularly noted this at Agbog Bloshi, who might be working in the pr presence of uh, raw sewage. There's infectious disease risk there. They may have inadequate access to food, inadequate access to water. The water they may have access to might be contaminated, likewise for their food. So all of these things are issues. I, I pulled this picture out specifically. So here's Dr. Austin Brenneman uh, and Suzanne, who's also in the audience here talking to this worker about how he takes apart dishwashers and you know right next literally one meter away from where he's doing this is his kitchen where he cooks and where he eats so again you don't have to be an environmental health scientist to see the potential for cross-contamination here so the workers always have the worst of it but again in addition to exposing themselves they are creating issues for the community too what might that look like well uh, there's no shortage of pictures from our research teams collectively and on the internet about the ecological degradation that can uh, result from this. Just tremendous environmental damage. We've got issues with air pollution. Again, you heard Dr. Goet talk about how that plume of smoke actually only became a problem when the downstream or um, downwind communities started to say, where is all this smoke coming from and why is it so nasty? Uh, we've got issues with widespread water pollution. We've got potential for soil and food contamination. So I showed you a photo earlier of a nice pristine rice paddy. Well, if that rice paddy is immediately adjacent to a burn site, you've got potential contamination of what you're then farming as a, a subsistence uh, or sustenance food. And anytime we've got an e-waste collection network, we've talked about this already, you've got increased vehicular traffic. So there's air pollution, there's crashes, there's injury risks there. So again, just to zoom in on this crop issue. So here's a shot, again, of a, a rice paddy in Northeast um, Thailand. Here's actually the farmer and one of his helpers who we ended up talking to. And we asked him, gosh, uh, what do you think about your rice paddy being right next to this e-waste dump site? And he said, well, I'm not very happy about it, but I have to farm and I have to sell this rice to support my family. And I said, well, who do you sell the rice to? And he's like, well, not my village. We send this to the next village over. And that's not right, but I don't want to poison my people. Uh, so there's acknowledgement here that this is probably not good, but there's also a very hard decision point that this has to be sold somewhere. So I was like, export it to America, market organic, sell it at Whole Foods, you can make 10 times the money. Uh, so we've got potential contamination of agricultural products, which is a huge concern here. Also maybe potential harm to pollinators that are helping us uh, propagate our crops from year to year. Uh, we also have issues with not just crops, but livestock and wildlife. So animals grazing and feeding. So this is the Agbogbloshi site that you heard Dr. Fobel talk about earlier. There's actually a herd of cattle and a herd of goats that live on that site. Uh, they eke out a, a life and then ultimately perhaps are butchered and sold at the local market. Probably not the healthiest diet and all of the heavy metals and chemicals that they're taking in are then being transferred to the unknowing buying public at the market. Uh, we've seen this uh, actually everywhere we've gone, that there's chickens, there's other small livestock uh, sort of coexisting among the e-waste. In fact, when I was at Koksa'at, I watched a, a large turkey uh, slowly pecking away at a thing of styrofoam, like this giant block of styrofoam, and he finished it off in like five minutes. Uh, it must have tasted good, because he was going through it really quickly, but probably not very healthy for him or for the uh, people who subsequently consume him. And again, I'm focusing mostly on people here because I'm a public health person, but of course we've got impacts on the fauna uh, and the, the animal life around these operations. I mentioned water contamination, absolutely a concern. So here's a shot from Agbar Bloshi. This is a, a pond that's formed at the burn site in Thailand. So here we've got folks who uh, may be trying to eat fish out of contaminated bodies of water. Even if they're not trying to eat them, the fish have a right to live too. So massive uh, contamination concerns here. Something else we've noticed that was pretty common is uh, either not a lot of awareness or just not a lot of concern about preparing food at the same place that the waste is being recycled. So I, hopefully you can see on this picture here, this is in someone's e-waste recycling workshop and uh, we're surrounded by grease and PCBs and God knows what else and here we've got this half-eaten hot dog. So this person put it down uh, when their lunch break ended, they're gonna come back for it later. We saw, as I said, plenty of circumstances where people were preparing food on the same surface that 10 minutes before they were recycling these heavy metals and other contaminants on. We were concerned enough about this that we actually took some wipe samples to see what's getting deposited 
uh, on these surfaces. And another issue, so maybe unique to Thailand, but as uh, you heard Dr. Goet say, a lot of these people were farmers historically. And so we noticed, for example, that um, everyone had a, a rice storage building where they would keep the rice for them to eat. And in all of those rice storage buildings were also the storage for the pesticides they used to grow the rice. Uh, so you can see here we've got an applicator dripping right onto the rice that's there for consumption. So that's not an e-waste issue, that's just a general public health issue, but maybe it's something that we could tie into uh, a campaign to improve the health uh, for these e-waste communities. Uh, another concern here is children, of course. So we always think of children as sort of the uh, ultimate in vulnerable populations. They're young, they're developing, they're very susceptible to a lot of different um, effects from chemicals. And so what we've observed in all of the countries we've been to is a lot of these are families, again, doing the recycling in their homes. So so here's a woman um, uh, watching these workers uh, dismantling e-waste in this shared shop, and we got to know her baby quite well. Her baby was there all day long. Uh, where else uh, is she going to be? Uh, again, when we're out doing surveys, interviews, taking uh, health measurements, we were constantly surrounded by children. And you think, well, gosh, they're getting exposed to who knows what. We've already documented all these chemicals that they're being exposed to, and there's literally, literally zero separation uh, for them between where the home ends and where this work activity begins. So again, children may actually have the worst exposures. Some of them are crawling around in the dirt that might be mostly cadmium, mostly lead, mostly uh, other metals. And they've also got special behavioral patterns like this hand-to-mouth behavior that puts them at extra risk. So children should always be a, a chief concern here. Uh, just winding down, we've got other issues. So access to service. Uh, a lot of the informal recyclers we've talked to in all three countries said, basically, I don't have access to medical care, uh, either because I can't afford it or because it's not close by or it's not convenient. Uh, and so that's for sort of direct physical health care, mental health care, equally out of uh, reach for many of these folks. Uh, so for example, we ran into people who had no problem um, getting syringes so they could make injections for, uh, for their um, uh, treatment of diabetes, uh, but in this case didn't have access to waste disposal. So now we've got a house that's filled with dirty syringes. That's also a, a major public health hazard. Uh, and the fact that in some countries this e-waste recycling is illegal or prohibited only puts these people further out of reach. They don't want to make waves or make a, a reputation for themselves uh, by requesting access to services. So I'll just wrap up by saying what don't we know? I've been sort of going through a litany of issues, all of which I think we have plenty of documentation on. We don't need more studies. We need to actually do something about this. Uh, what we need, I think, are studies that actually make the connection between, okay, here's the exposure, here's the health effect, and here's an intervention that we could do, uh, as you heard Dr. Austin Brenneman said, that might increase your efficiency while also making this safer and more healthy for your family. So that's uh, absolutely a priority for us. The other thing is a lot of the work on e-waste um, in terms of research has been done at just a handful of very large sites, Agbag Veloshi being one of them. Uh, so do the results from that site translate to other smaller sites around the world? I think we don't have uh, a strong enough body of evidence to uh, know that for sure at this point. So with that, I think I am out of time. So uh, again, we'll, we'll hold for questions. We've got half an hour for our panel discussion after this. But hopefully between these uh, various talks, you're starting to get a picture of, gosh, well, here are some problems, but also here are some tools that we could use to approach and ultimately fix those problems. So thank you so much for your time.